Sorry, I don't love you. A friends have grown accustomed to. Cause with you, something isn't wrong. Something isn't wrong. Something isn't right. I wish you could be. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Geekdom is Back, as is Megan Moore. We're talking all about Coco today. Megan, I know this is something that you were excited to talk about, but you're also. So, somewhat sad because of the movie so you know ho- hopefully you won't be crying during this episode but if you do that's okay too <laughs> that's fine I watched this movie for the first time a few weeks ago because I am so behind on the times and I was just waiting for it to be on Netflix and I was not expecting to cry as much as I did I'd been warned and warned by many many people and it just Whew, it hit me in the feels hard. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of people felt about this movie. I remember I was sitting in the theater. I went by myself because I will happily go by myself to the movies all the time, pretty much. And I was like kind of looking around the theater. I was like, is this affecting everyone else this way? Like, what is going on? And it wasn't a packed theater by any means. I tend to go when it's less crowded just because I feel like that's a more comfortable viewing experience because you're like okay there won't be too many people there won't be a ton of people talking during the movie especially something like this because a lot of kids would go see this since it is a Pixar movie and I was a little worried about that but my viewing experience was very pleasant for this movie and I was really amazed with how well they did pretty much everything in this movie. But I think we're going to go ahead and start off with the cast and the characters because there are some big names in this film, even though, you know, the main actor who voices Miguel isn't super well known because he is a kid still, which makes sense when you have, you know, a kid in a Pixar movie that a kid would voice said character. Right. I mean... When I found out who was going to be in this cast, I had high hopes for this. Like, I have been excited for Coco since I heard about it in, like, the early Inception days. As soon as I found out that Gil Garcia Bernal was on board, I was so excited. I love him so much. (laughs) And I think several years ago in my college Spanish textbook, shout out to Mazaikos, there was a picture of Gail in it. I was just like, oh, great. My Mexican boyfriend is in this book. This is this is great. Yeah, and you have some actors and actresses in this who are very familiar just because they're in, you know, American TV shows and everything like that. Or, you know, Gabriel Iglesias is a comedian. So you have these people who are fairly well known but sometimes when you're only hearing their voice it takes a while for that to click like when I was watching this I was totally unaware that Natalia Cordova Buckley who is in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was the voice of Frida Kahlo in this I was like oh (laughs) all right if you say so I guess that's what happened there and you have Benjamin Bratt who voiced Ernesto and he's one of the main characters in the movie too and you know some of these names are familiar quite a few of them weren't familiar to me and I think that's either because they're newer actors or actresses or just because they are from you know the Mexican television world and I do not follow that at all well okay looking at this list I did have to look up um, the corrections officer in the movie because as soon as I saw him and heard him I was like that voice is so, so familiar. And as it turns out, the corrections officer is Cheech Marin, you know, of Cheech and Chong fame. And it says here that Alana Noel Ubach is Mama Imelda, who is Miguel's late great great grandmother and the mother of Coco. Alana is uh, Serena in Legally Blonde. And uh, (laughs) that's something I think only hardcore Legally Blonde fans would know, like who Serena is. But that's one of um, Elle's friends. Yeah, I would not have guessed that just based off of her voice. Yeah, it's... She's 
dude, I'm surprised I actually kind of picked up on that. But yeah, I know the voice cast is fantastic. And a lot of these actors and actresses were also in a lot of uh, telenovelas as well. Like in typical Mexican cinema, which rocks. Yeah, well, we are definitely both in agreement on how well casted this was. And, you know, with voice acting, I feel like in a way it's a bit harder because you're like, okay, you are hearing these voices, but you're seeing different faces and you're like, okay, wait, is that who I think it is? And you you can't tell just from looking at them because they're playing animated characters. So I think they did a really nice job of, you know, giving us just enough of familiar actors and actresses in this to where you're like, okay, yeah, this is perfect. But one of the big things that I want to talk about for the movie too is the music because you know you and I hosted a music podcast once upon a time hasn't been that long mm-hmm. since, since we did that but <laughs> you know it, it feels like it's been a while and music is sort of the whole reason this movie keeps pushing forward you know Miguel just wants to pursue his passion for music and you know he looks up to Ernesto at least for a good chunk of the movie before he you know sort of finds out what really went on behind the scenes which you know music industry regardless of where it is probably has plenty of fishy people in it so (laughs) it's one of those things where you know maybe you and I weren't quite as surprised by what happened behind the scenes but you know for someone like Miguel that's going to be heartbreaking for him Mm -hmm. and the music oh my gosh I saw the Grammys performance where I think it was the Grammys that they perform this song. Or maybe I'm thinking of the Emmys. I might be thinking of the Emmys. But anyway, one of the television performances this year actually had um, Gail Garcia Bernal singing. And I believe they threw Miguel in as well. Like, Miguel is also on the soundtrack with his version of Remember Me, and it's so much fun. Oh, my gosh. But, of course, you know, feelings everywhere. I did have the feels during that Emmy performance. Oscars. It was the Oscars. There we go. (laughs) Thinking, you know, I'm cycling through all of the award shows, but I do believe Coco picked up a Grammy as well for Best Original Song. Yes. Remember Me did win Best Original Song in the Grammys. And it also won Best Original Song for the Oscars. Okay. Unless I am, like, looking at this wrong. I might be looking at this wrong. (laughs) Too many award uh, shows to keep track of. (laughs) I know. I know. But I only remember it because I think Sofyan was on before or after the Coco performance. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, Look How Far I'll Go was nominated for a Grammy. Never mind. (laughs) See, too many many Disney Pixar films with awesome soundtracks. But the music, too, is... It's fun. It took Pixar six years to really immerse themselves in the Mexican music scene to come up with an amazing soundtrack for Coco. And there's an article over at Remezcla about how long it took everyone to do this. Because I think if you want to have a movie like this, like The Book of Life is another movie that's about Dia de los Muertos. And... I think people were thinking Coco was going to be more like that movie, Um, but the animators really just immersed themselves, and I love it so much, and they put a lot of thought and effort into it, which I think might be more than any other Disney Pixar film. Maybe not Disney as a whole scale, but Pixar definitely. Yeah, plus Pixar movies typically take longer than a live action feature film anyway, just because of how much detail and precision has to go into making each and every scene. And I think with the music here, you know, it's not just a background soundtrack. It is part of the movie. You know, it plays this crucial role in advancing the story and having Miguel basically show how he feels And you get this sense that, you know, it's a big part of their culture, too. And even though Miguel's family in particular doesn't really want anything to do with music, you can tell 
from all of the musical scenes in the movie how much it means to a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And I did find it interesting that Miguel's family was just anti-music altogether. And I had to laugh at that because I was like, what family could be this anti-music? Like, oh my gosh, when you are in Mexico, it's everywhere from the mariachi bands to, to, well, everybody essentially. And I did like that in the movie, the spirits of his family did embrace the whole, well, we do like music. We just had to keep it hidden within ourselves because I believe it is his great grandmother, great, great grandmother, Coco's mother, who has a lovely singing voice. And she didn't really sing as much after her husband left to pursue a music career. Yeah, and the story unfolds in a very interesting and unique way. You know, when the movie started, it's like, okay, this kid has a dream. He looks up to this guy and to Miguel, he's just a stranger. You know, he's just the biggest singer in Mexico at the time. And, you know, his legacy has lived on long enough for him to become fascinated and really interested in his music. So it's one of those things where, you know, at first you're like, okay, that's cool. This kid, he has a dream. And then as the movie progresses, you're like, oh, there's a lot more to this than we initially thought going into the movie. And even probably for what I would say, like the first half of the movie or so. Mm hmm. Ah, and I remembered, like, in the second half of the movie, there was something I wanted to talk about regarding the music. And, of course, it's in this Remezcla article, as I'm kind of scanning it. But they even go in and do, like, the Mexican street music. They go in and have various influences. And I just found this out, because I know when I saw the movie for the first time, I saw the DJ wearing a Give Cumbia a Chance t-shirt, which is from the Mexican Institute of Sound. And... This is actually really cool. So, okay, as I'm sitting here talking in circles, Camila Lara is one of the, or is the music consultant for Coco. And he actually did make a cameo in the movie. Okay. Not necessarily as himself, but as a skeleton DJ, that DJ that's in the Give Cumbia a Chance in the party scene in right. the second half of the movie. And you could tell it was him because he has a signature bowler hat. And also, he has electronic expertise. So he technically had his own song on this film, which is really, really cool. Yeah, and you also have Miguel's relationship with his guitar, too, to look into. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just that he loves music. He wants to play it he wants to be a singer and he wants to you know make he a... doesn't want to make shoes right and I kind of don't blame him you know music sounds a lot more exciting than making shoes but you know shoes are obviously a thing we all need so still an important job but I can understand that as a kid Miguel isn't nearly as interested in that as he is with you know becoming this big star like Ernesto and you know, he goes to, I guess, Ernesto's crypt, and he just wants to see the guitar that he played. And later on, he finds out, you know, that Ernesto took credit for songs that he didn't necessarily write. And you see Hector show up, too, and you see his love for music, but he's sort of been beaten down by not necessarily the system, but the music industry system, basically, and what Ernesto has done for, you know, so many years, even in, you know, the afterlife that they are living in over in the land of the dead. Right. And it was interesting to see just the evolution of Ernesto, because he was essentially like the top movie star Everyone wanted to be him. Everyone fawned over him. Right. And of course, like, because of his association with music, Miguel's family basically was like, you cannot support this man. He's terrible. So, you know, you have that leading him to believe that he is, in fact, the great-great-grandson of Ernesto de la Cruz. 
but since, you know, this is Welcome to Geekdom and spoilers are everywhere, <laughs> it's not the case. And he becomes the villain. And he is just like, I think he might be one of the meanest Disney villains I've ever seen. Just because of the betrayal and because of what he does. Because who purposely kills like their best friend and bandmate to steal their music and take on that success? It just, I don't know. It seems so heartless, even for a Disney film. Yeah, it's not like he's Thanos wanting to destroy half of the Earth or anything like that. But in a sense, because of how personal his relationship with Hector is and the fact that he still goes and stabs him in the back like that, it's just mm -hmm. one of those things where you're like, how could success mean that much to someone? You know, they could have easily shared the spotlight it's not like there's only ever one person that we focus on in either the film industry or music industry at any given time if there were that would be a little ridiculous you know it's like okay today's you know Kendrick Lamar day tomorrow's Taylor Swift day like that's not how it works so to see him be that hungry for the success and willing to go to literally any length to ensure he has that success you're just sort of sitting there and wondering like where did this guy go wrong you know obviously success affects people in very different ways you have people who are very humble about it and clearly that was not the case with Ernesto and you know Hector just wanted to make a living and take care of his family he wasn't asking for the whole world <laughs> right and of course I like that his family decided to take up the humble job of shoemaking yeah, because clearly, if you have a hatred of music hammering away at shoes all day, giving some sort of rhythm, it's still there in your in your bones. Exactly. Bones. We're talking about Coco <laughs> with all the skeletons. Oh, man. Well, speaking of the skeletons, there is one specific shot from the film that I want to discuss because, you know, when Dia de los Muertos comes around, basically the lore is that you get to go visit the land of the dead for a day, I believe it is, 24 hours. And you get to, you know, see all of the, the relatives that you no longer get to spend time with. So, you know, Miguel finds out about this and he goes over there and I believe at this point he's already kind of adopted Dante he just keeps following him around <laughs> and mm -hmm. you see him on the bridge and they sort of pan out to this panoramic view of the land of the dead and there's just all these lights and colors and it's just an amazing shot I'm going to have to go back and find either the video or article that shows how Pixar went through and brought this shot to life because it really is fascinating and this was a shot that you know when I was sitting in the theater I was like wow this is like the epitome of Pixar quality right here in this one shot and you know he didn't even have to be doing anything because his reaction was the same as our reaction when we saw that you know he's just like wide-eyed and staring at it like whoa what is this <laughs> Exactly. And you know, this is where I wish I had actually seen it in a movie theater because to see that on a big screen, that would have been incredible. And I love that they actually took this and kind of conceptualized what the underworld looks like as this giant bright party, just a giant city of lights. And I love it so much. And of course, I also love the fact that the entrance and exit is basically like a train station. Yeah. <laughs> or which like going to Disneyland. I thought was really cute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it wouldn't be Disney unless you had some sort of reference like that. <laughs> but that whole scene, it was breathtaking. And I think it has some of the most detail that I've ever seen in a Pixar film. Oh, yeah. It's super detailed. And whenever I get around to finding that article or video on it, It'll blow your mind even more when you take a look at that and you see how long it took for this one shot. And you mentioned it taking six years for this movie. It's not only because they were trying to nail down the cultural aspects of it, but animation just is not a fast process in general. I mean, you know, Incredibles 2 is out. And it's, what, 14 years after the first one? I'm not saying it took them 14 years to make the movie itself, but it's like, you know... 
animated movies aren't necessarily in a hurry to just sort of have this quick turnaround like we see with the Star Wars, Marvel, DC movies and those big studios like that, because there's something about animation that, you know, when that doesn't look as good, it really, really hurts the movie in a way that maybe, you know, some bad special effects in a live action film here or there doesn't totally kill the mood of the movie. Sometimes it can, but not always. So, you know, animation is a whole different animal. And this shot was just like, okay, here's what Pixar has been doing. And here is the payoff in one shot, basically. Exactly. And oh my gosh. So I'm on the Wikipedia page for Coco. And I mean, when I say that they immerse themselves in Mexican culture, they even immerse themselves in the Mexican folk art, bringing to life the colorful everything that we see. And it's also important to take note that Coco took inspiration from two Miyazaki films, Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle. The fact that the animators and director of Coco took in inspiration from a, from two Studio Ghibli films just warms my heart knowing that so much because Studio Ghibli and Miyazaki have had such an impact on the world today that of course I'm going to you know fawn over that but it's also interesting to note that they took inspiration from the action film John Wick for this that is definitely interesting and I do want to talk more about the culture because, you know, with me being in Southern California, these things are fairly prominent here, even though, you know, it's not Mexico, but a lot of Hispanic people live in Southern California. And, you know, it's probably a little different for you because you're quite, (laughs) quite a distance from Mexico itself. But, you know, Uh here you have tons of people celebrating Cinco de Mayo, Dia de los Muertos. So, you know, even though it's not Mexico, you still get these glimpses of this culture and what it means to these people here. And, you know, I think the fact that they made this movie so specific to one culture, but made it something that you could still enjoy and find educational, especially for people like you and I who aren't part of this culture. You know, I didn't go into this movie like, oh, well, I probably won't like it because I don't celebrate these things. You know, for me, I was like, oh, sweet. Pixar is doing something new, something different. I was excited for it because, you know, how many movies have been like about white kids when it comes to Pixar? (laughs) You know, it's like, I think they did a really great job diversifying, but telling a story that a lot of people can still relate to in a sense as far as following your dreams and, you know, for those who want to be in the music industry, just sort of going after that. And, you know, you still have these common themes that it doesn't matter what race, religion, or culture you come from. It's just like, okay, people know what betrayal is. <laughs> you know, that, that that's not like something that isn't universal to everyone all over the place. Right. And I mean, I took years of Spanish, both in high school and in college. So the idea behind Dia de los Muertos was one that always interested me. Right. For some reason, I've got this weird obsession with the dead. So go (laughs) figure. But on top of that, it's also rehashing everything that I've learned as a gringo. I guess technically it'd be gringa since A is the feminine form. Anyway, you know, brief Spanish lesson there. But as I'm going through some of the trivia on IMDb as well, it's interesting to see just how much thought and detail they put into this. Like it says here that there were themes and content that would ordinarily be banned in China, but apparently the Chinese censor board members were so touched by this movie that they made an exception and allowed it. Like the Chinese who would probably be some of the last people to have a true grasp on Latin culture were so moved by this that they were like, yeah, let's just keep it the way it is. And it says here that the orange flower that's constantly seen throughout the film is the Aztec marigold, also known as the Mexican marigold. And it's the traditional flower that's used during Dia de los Muertos to guide the dead to the living. And of course, I love this so 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 much the dog Dante he is not your typical dog 
Right. Like, I'm. you told me earlier that you've seen a bunch of these dogs in person and you just don't find them appealing, which I understand because it's a hairless dog. Yeah. Not necessarily in person, but just from watching dog shows and whatnot. Probably some in person, too, though, just based on my geographic location. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it says here that the spirit of Frida Kahlo sees Dante and says, oh, he's a Zolo. And the interesting thing is that during Frida Kahlo's lifetime, the Zolo breed began to decline in popularity. So she and her husband, Diego Rivera, helped save the breed by including it in their art. Like, who'd have thought that a famous artist would have helped save a dog breed? Yeah, it's certainly not a super common breed here from what I can tell. But, you know, me personally, I'm just not much of a small dog person unless it's a corgi and maybe, you know, a few other exceptions. But it's just one of those things where, you know, they took this dog in the movie who was, you know, the dog was pretty much homeless and he just started following Miguel around. And it's another thing that he fed him. Yeah, it's because he fed him. It was another thing, too, that his family didn't really want him to be pursuing. So, you know, he kind of hid the dog for a while. And, you know, the dog sort of felt like he wasn't too welcome in certain situations and would hide on his own and Miguel would go find him. But then, you know, he travels to the land of the dead with him and he becomes this spirit animal and he's colorful and you know a a much more pleasant dog to look at in my opinion at that point and like you said the, the colors that they use in this film too it's just amazing you know I'm not always a person who loves bright neon colors but in this instance it works with the story they're telling so it's like okay you know it's just a big old party over at the land of the dead which you know good for them let them party that's cool and it's one of those things where okay you know this comes once a year where you can travel and i believe you have to have a picture of the person you're going to see or something like that they have some way to verify who it is you're traveling to come see in the land of the dead and you know, you see people being denied access, pretty much, and people oh, like, trying uh, to dress Hester. up, yeah, and people trying to dress up as other people and get by. And I think, you know, it's one of those things where, even though overall the film sort of has this sad undertone to it, there's still plenty of comedic moments in it. And I feel like this movie really just encapsulated so many different emotions too it's like you know when you go watch a horror movie you're expecting to be scared and you know when you go watch an action movie your adrenaline's probably pumping along with the movie but with this it's like up and down up and down and sideways and you're just like i don't know what to feel at this point this is true i mean my emotions were on a roller coaster definitely and i got made fun of by my boyfriend and his roommates for crying. Like, I was audibly sobbing. Like, it was it was bad. And, you know, that's just what Pixar movies do to me. So I'm fully, you know, waiting to cry during The Incredibles 2 when I see it. But going back to the happy things, you mentioned the spirit animals earlier and how Dante turns into a spirit animal. It makes me wonder if he was actually one the whole time. Because it was a little unusual that he was able to cross with Miguel. And then, of course, the family's spirit animal, also known as an alabrije. We've got Pepita, that like wild cheetah cat hybrid bird thing. (laughs) Yeah, it's like we don't even know what it is. I think that's the best way to put it. But the alabrije's name is Pepita. And, of course, you would think that At that point in the movie, when Miguel's relatives want him to go back to the land of the living with the condition that he never play music ever again, were the villains. So, of course, you're going to see this giant cheetah bird hybrid thing and be terrified of it and think that it's going to be the main villain of the movie. But no, it was not, which I thought was great. And that when they get to the end, you actually see Dante and a kitten playing together as if they had known each other all of their lives. So it makes me wonder that 
if these animals are so fantastic in the land of the dead, do they have a living counterpart as well that could be something as harmless as a kitten? That's definitely interesting to think about. And I don't think I put quite that much thought into Dante's role when I was watching this. But, you know, this is one of those movies where I I didn't watch it again to prep for this because I felt like I still knew enough about the movie and remembered enough about it to talk about it for quite a while here. But I think this is something that I would definitely rewatch, especially now that it's on Netflix. You know, that makes it 10 times easier to watch something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is just one of those things where in the moment you get so wrapped up in everything that is happening in this movie when it ended and I got up to leave the th- got up to leave the theater I was like what did what just happened <laughs> you know it's like you know what happened but you're still trying to process it for quite some time after you see the movie and one other thing I want to talk about too is how he finally gets his family to come around basically and expose Ernesto for who he really is and you see Miguel really has to wear them down a lot you know they're searching for him in the land of the dead and he's just basically on his own with Dante and Hector at times and he's just trying to get to the bottom of everything and he's so determined that even if he isn't thinking about, you know, his dream of being a musician and a star for the entirety of the film, his determination is still there. And to finally see his family come around was a very nice moment because it was like this weight was lifted off of their shoulders that they had been keeping all of these years. And you see that at the end when Miguel's talking to his what do we say great great grandmother i don't i don't even know there's yes. there's a lot of a lot of generations in this movie and then you know she starts singing and that moment it was just like yes this is everything we've sort of been waiting for even though it doesn't necessarily wind up being miguel fully getting his dream or anything like that but it's just so refreshing to have that moment happen at the end of the movie and you're like okay you know this family is going to be just fine and of course you know that's the point where I started bawling uncontrollably because it was so sweet that by him singing remember me to her it unlocked all of her memories and you later come to find out that she had kept all of the letters that Hector had written her over the years even though you the movie made it seem like she wanted nothing to do with him. And lo and behold, she did. And that's how everyone found out the truth about Ernesto de la Cruz. Yeah, it was certainly a triumph, too, because you're like, okay, you know, this guy used so many people, especially Hector, though. And to finally mm-hmm. have the truth come out about that and to no longer see these people praising him even long after he's gone it's like okay you know this was a big win here for everyone involved except for Ernesto which who cares at this point (laughs) Mm -hmm. exactly and I don't know like it was just a really good feel-good movie if you want to ball your eyes out (laughs) oh man but it had a lot of like great themes behind it too. Yeah, there's so much going on in this movie that it's really hard to quantify it almost. You're like, okay, you know, you have these really fantastic happy moments, you have th- these parties and you have Miguel getting to sing, but then you have these really sad moments when he's finding out the truth and you have dogs, that's always good. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There's oh, just totally. so so many different pieces in this movie that come together to make that ending what it is. And I can't even imagine trying to write something half as good as this movie ever in my lifetime. And it's one of those things where, you know, looking back on it now, I don't recall what I gave Coco when I put it in letterbox. I might've done like a three and a half or four at the time, but I'm thinking I might need to bump that up on a rewatch. (laughs) I think this is one that I'm definitely going to have to rewatch just to catch more of the small details. Like, 
going through the IMDb trivia page, it's actually a fairly lengthy one for a movie. And it says here that there's hidden Mickeys in the movie in Disney tradition. And it's also the second movie in the Pixar franchise that features a dog to have a major part. And of course, you know, that should ring alarm bells for anyone because of how much I've been talking about crying. And because the first movie with a dog that has such a crucial role is dug from up. Right. Like, I was basically crying at the levels of the first 15 minutes of Up. <laughs> and that's that's a ride right there. But then you also have really, really small details in here. Like this one that you'd really have to watch closely. Um, I just passed it. And I, I know I saw it. But it says here, maybe I should just, you know, do a control F and find it. But <laughs> it's... Um, First of all, while I'm here, Disney normally does a Mexican and a Spanish dub for its films. Like, it, sometimes the Spanish in Spain can vary from the Spanish in Mexico. Right. But they didn't do a Spanish dub of it. They just did a Mexican one. So that makes sense. And, aha, I'm almost there. I am almost there. The small detail that is really cool to learn about involves actually being a musician and kind of knowing how the guitar works. So each time a guitar is played in the movie, instead of the typical strumming that we normally see, Pixar made sure to include the detail that the fingering of the actual chords matches up with what's actually playing. Like, that is an incredible eye for detail right there. Yeah, and it's something that, while it's probably not easy to do, you can sort of make sure that that is accurate in the movie because you are having these people create these characters in, you know, whatever software they use. But, you know, if someone in real life is trying to play a musician and they don't actually play an instrument, I get the feeling it would be significantly harder to train them to, you know, hold the chords the right way and hold the guitar the right way and everything like that. So that is a really nice detail to have them put in there that you might not always be able to get otherwise. Exactly. Oh, my heart. <laughs> it says here that this is actually the fifth Pixar film to have the end at the end of a movie. The other four movies that had that were A Bug's Life, which people commonly forget was actually a Pixar film too. Finding Nemo, Ratatouille, and of course... The sequel to Finding Nemo, Finding Dory. Interesting. Mm hmm I think it's interesting that they're keeping some of these Pixar films open-ended, kind of. Yeah, and I think that's why we're able to get things like Incredibles 2 14 years later, because that ending in The Incredibles, which I ironically just recently watched, you know, I waited way too long to watch that. And it's one of those things where you're like, okay, yeah. If this does not have a sequel, I'm fine with it. But if it does, that's awesome. And with animation, you don't have to worry as much about things like, oh, well, you know, the actors and actresses are 14 years older. So that's also a perk of films like this. It's like, okay, if they can still emulate the same voice, but maybe slightly older, that totally works out fine. This is true. And oh man, now we're into the spoiler part of the trivia section. Oh, this is funny. It says here that this is the first Pixar film to show an on-screen death of a major character. So we've got the death of Ernesto being crushed by a falling bell. And then we have the actual poisoning. This goes into my whole standpoint of, man, that was like the meanest evilest Disney film I've ever seen because you don't really see the act of death of poisoning or like just being crushed to death by a large bell. Yeah, they definitely did a lot of new things with this movie too, not just, you know, diversifying with it, but like you said, there are so many things about Coco that just stand out from other Pixar films in general that it's really hard to not pay attention to this movie at all if you follow 
Pixar in any sense. And I'll be the first to admit that there are quite a few big Pixar movies that I haven't seen. You know, I haven't seen Ratatouille. I don't think I've seen Finding Dory yet. I'm just generally bad at watching movies in a timely manner, which is why I have a whole feature over at Substream about how bad I am at it. So it's one of those things where, you know, this one, it just grabbed me right away. So I was like, okay, I am going to go see this because music and because I think it looks really fantastic. It does. It is just, ugh. Pixar films make me so happy. And I don't mind that I'm probably like the oldest kid in a the theater watching <laughs> them. Like when Toy Story 3 came out. I still have to see that. Don't hate me. Yeah, I can't hate you. <laughs> but I think in that one, my brother and I went with my dad to see it. And that was, oh my gosh, like what, eight years ago? Yes, it was eight years ago because we were coming back up from Atlanta and made a pit stop in Virginia at our new house when we were first like moving here. And that was also the first film where I openly cried in front of my family, like in a theater, <laughs> because just there, there was a scene in there that I'm not even going to mention for the sake of not spoiling you that just caused me to cry. And then I saw Finding Dory with my mom. Um, funnily enough, I was the oldest child there with a parent, but in that defense, my mom and I were killing time while waiting for her car to be ready at the shop and this was the same day she had said she was never going to go to another movie theater <laughs> in the wake of all of the shootings that had oh, been happening yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know we saw Finding Dory and as soon as the preview trailers came on I'm already in tears as soon as the little Disney well the Pixar like pre-film clip goes on I am actively losing it and of course, you know, there are times in Finding Dory when I am also trying not to sob. And then at the end, um, as we were leaving the theater, I saw a small child who was not old enough to be born when Finding Nemo was out holding a small Nemo. And then I cried some more. That one just really hit me in the feels, though. <laughs> yeah, I definitely heard similar reactions from other people on that movie, too. But is there anything else about Coco that you want to touch on before we wrap this up? I think you and I definitely agree on how well done this movie was and how much we both enjoy it, which, you know, that always makes these more fun, too, because you can watch a movie and criticize it all you want. But for me, this was something I just went to go see and I wanted to have fun with it. And I did. And it just really impressed me overall. And it's sort of refreshing to just have those kind of moments with movies because, you know, with you, you write about music a lot. And for me, I write about so many different things that sometimes I feel like, okay, I just need to watch something or read something so I can enjoy it. It doesn't need to be work. And even though, you know, going to watch things and quote unquote work on them is still fun at times. It's sort of one of those things where you're like, okay, I'm just going to turn off the critic brain for a bit and go watch this. Right. Like I had heard so many mixed things about Coco and I was just like, you know what? Whatever. I'm still going to see it. I don't care what people say. And the same goes for The Incredibles too. Right. Like it, it's fine. Like I can handle the bad criticism because if I like a film, I like a film. Yeah, definitely. And there are certain movies where it's like the fans get really intense about everything. You know, Star Wars comes to mind immediately, especially when The Last Jedi came out. But, you know, I think the fan remake of The Last Jedi. Oh, yes, that is the thing that's going on right now. <laughs> I, I saw someone post a rebuttal to that, that there's a comic book adaptation for it because Marvel's been doing that with all of the new Star Wars films. Like there's a Force Awakens comic, there's a Rogue One comic. And the guy was just like, yep, here's your remake. Bye. <laughs> People these days. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to touch on? I made it through this podcast without crying. <laughs> you did. You did. Oh, that's the good thing is I'm not actively crying like I was watching the film. <laughs> Well, that's probably nice for you to just be able to talk about it and be like, yes, this was emotional. And yes, here we are talking about it. Exactly. 
Awesome. Well, Megan, thank you so much for coming on to talk about this. I I felt like I had to ask quite a few people because some people were like, I don't think I could handle it. I don't know. I loved Coco. Don't know if I want to talk about it. <laughs> so, you know, thank you again for coming on because this was a really fun discussion. It was. I always enjoy our discussions together. As do I. And that's all we have for you guys today. So as always, thank you all for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.